Hello, PsyQ community, and welcome to today's webinar, Neurosecretary of Depression. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Chloe Liu, and I am a clinical scientific liaison from Otsuka Field Medical Affairs team. I will serve as the moderator for today's discussion featuring Dr. Sean Siddiqui and Dr. Nolan Williams. Today's presentation is sponsored by Otsuka Pharmaceutical Development and Commercialization, Inc. and Lumbeck LLC. The speakers are paid consultants for Otsuka Pharmaceutical Development and Commercialization, Inc. Today's session is to talk about this very broad topic of neurocircuitry and depression. So we'll try to distill it down by thinking about, first of all, heterogeneity in major depression and evolution of our understanding of depression. And we'll introduce neurocircuits, what that means and how we measure it, and what they uh, and how we believe they function in mood disorders. And then how advances in imaging can uh, help our understanding of neurocircuitry and help facilitate personalized treatment. And finally, summarize all that and discuss it a little bit more. Yeah, so um, major depressive disorder is a uh, clinically heterogeneous disorder. So this is a condition that can present in thousands of different ways, thousands of different symptom constellations. You can, you can kind of break the condition down into three main domains. One is emotional, the second is cognitive, and the third is physical. The emotional domain deals with uh, kind of some of the core symptoms of depression, so sadness and uh, hopelessness, guilt, also um, suicidal ideation, anhedonia. The cognitive symptoms, um, you know, for some can be quite severe. Some people don't have them, um, but it's around kind of attention, planning, um, thinking speed, that sort of thing. And then the physical um, symptoms have a lot, uh, you know, have a wide presentation too. Some people don't have them much at all. Some people have a constellation of um, eating problems, so they're either eating too much or too little or sleeping too much or too little, sexual dysfunction and various kind of pain symptoms like uh, headache and stomach problems. Um, and so that that set of symptoms can be con combined in any individual, um, any, any combination of, of those individual symptoms to, to uh, meet criteria for major depressive uh, disorder diagnosis. And one of the reasons why we highlight this distinction is because when we're trying to study brain circuits, we uh, there's been a, uh, a long-standing search for subtypes of major depression. We've been doing that since before we knew about brain circuitry, but we, uh, we we try to figure out if we can see maybe these clusters don't have the same circuitry underpinnings. Uh, we're still looking for it, and we'll tell you guys a little bit about uh, about what we've found so far. Great. So there have been you know a whole host of hypotheses related to major depressive disorder through the years. Um, you know, the original theories behind depression had a lot more to do with psychological phenomenon. So, you know, in the, in the days of Freud and kind of thinking in terms of, of kind of psychiatric psychological content. Um, more recently, um, you know, there's, there's this kind of perspective around neurotransmitters and that's where a lot of the, the um, oral antidepressant drugs were born. And so this idea that um, that you need to somehow change serotonin or norp uh, uh, norepinephrine or um, or dopamine in the system and be able to um, affect those neurotransmitters neurotrans in such a way that you're able to kind of upregulate them through breaking down their uh, through stopping the breakdown of their um, metabolites. And so this is really the, the kind of psychiatry 2.0 perspective. Um, you know, over the last several years, genetics has come into play. You know, uh, there's no one single gene, obviously, for mood, but, um, you know, genetic kind of risk factors, hormones, immunology, this idea that there's inflammatory processes that may be affecting the brain and changing mood. We know that from, from drugs that do that, uh, like interferon for hepatitis C can produce a depressive syndrome. Um, as well as neurotrophic factors is this idea, which is particularly focused on in the ketamine research world, that you're modulating certain uh, neurotrophic factors like brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And so that's that's the um, that that's kind of the current conceptualization outside of the circuitry. It's interesting that we think of uh, uh, of the biological hypothesis as more recent or more current. When uh, I think uh, dating back to Hippocrates or Galen or Ibn Sina physicians from thousands of years ago considered depression to be a brain disorder, uh, but it wasn't until uh, until Freudian era that there, there, there emerged a debate about that topic, and I think we're starting to move back to, to sort of the original principles. 
Uh, and the, now when we talk about neurocircuitry, there are a few different ways that we think about it. And there, uh, there are a lot of different ways we can measure neuroimaging. For those of you who went to medical school, you, you're familiar with looking at the left image here, which is a T1 weighted MRI. It just tells us about what the brain structure looks like. Uh, the middle image is, uh, is a rest and state functional MRI, uh, or actually any type of functional MRI. Uh, what that does is it uh, looks at changes in blood flow or, or blood oxygenation in different parts of the brain, either in response to specific tasks or just at rest. And we can use that information to help figure out how different parts of the brain are activated or how different parts of the brain are connected. And the most direct way to measure connections is what we'll see on the right is diffusion tensor imaging, uh, at least the most direct way at a large scale. And what that does is it actually tr uses uh, water diffusion to trace out the white matter tracks that connect different parts of the brain. So it can look at direct connections in the brain. So, so when we talk about neurocircuitry, we are bringing all these things together to look at direct connections, indirect connections, and, and other sorts of relations. Yeah, and it's important to note that, you know, when we talk about a clinical MRI, we're really mainly talking about the image on the far left, and the other two images are kind of up and coming modalities that uh, kind of underlie a lot of the topics that we're talking about today, but aren't, aren't uh, consistently um, part of an, a clinical MRI, if you get a clinical MRI ordered. Yeah, that's, that's an important point. These are research tools and helps us understand the brain a little bit better, but you can't order them for your patient yet. Now, uh, now what, what we do with that information is we can help try to organize the brain into what we call large-scale brain networks or circuits. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to define that, but the most common is what we have here. So there are several different core networks, such as the default mode network, which gets a lot of attention, and it's in uh, light blue or aqua color here, which is involved in internally oriented reflection and rumination. Also get, uh, getting a lot of attention is the salience network, which is involved in uh, sustained attention to specific tasks or emotions. Uh, and that, that's uh, the pink network here. There's uh, the dorsal attention network, which is involved in externally oriented attention switching. This was for a long time considered to be a visual attention network. Then it was considered a, a cognitive attention network. And now we're thinking of it as a cognitive emotional attention network because switching from outside to inside your head it, it affects both cognition and emotion. Um, then there's the limbic system, which we've known about for a long time as, a, as something that governs emotion and memory. Uh, the frontal parietal control network, which is uh, purple and it's uh, is involved in sort of cognitive executive control. And then the uh, long known sensory motor and visual networks, which are yellow and blue here. Uh, and when we look at this information, it helps us not only examine how specific treatments affect specific brain circuits, uh, but, but also how we can titrate the right treatments for the right patients. Uh, and that's something that actually no one has been doing a lot of work on and we're trying to figure out how to target specific treatments for specific patients using this information. Yeah, we've been we've been very interested in this idea that um, that we can use these resting state networks to um, to actually um, tell us where within a larger named brain region to place, say, a TMS coil or an implanted cortical stimulator, and maybe even a deep brain stimulation electrode. So the the idea is that um, you know if these are circuit circuitopathies, uh, these psych neuropsychiatric conditions are circuitopathies, then you really need a circuit level intervention so it matches the you know the 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 accuracy of the positioning of the intervention matches the the kind of uh, level in which these um these circuit related illnesses are constrained so they're constrained to these specific brain circuits 